I'm a partner in Comprehensive Women's Care and OB General OBGYN in Columbus, Ohio. And what hospital do you work with? I work at uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital and St. Anne's, Mount Carmel St. Anne's. And am I paying you to do this? No. <laughs> How long have you been using this and what's your experience with it been? Okay. Uh, I believe we've been using the Trend Guard device for nine months. Okay. And um, it, it's been an excellent process. In fact, uh, we were talking about the fact that when we were trialing it, there was one device for three robotic rooms, and we were playing tug of war, war with each other to see who got the who got the device. Uh, it started off that when we were initially doing robotic procedures, we would do this elaborate taping process, shoulder to hip, padding, blue foam. The whole thing took about 15, 20 minutes just to get the patient ready before even the surgery began. And now it's like a maybe two, three minute process to get the person uh, secured to the OR table. And every single time I test them in work for no other reason to reassure the anesthesiologists or the CRNAs that it's okay. And we actually test them in Trendelenburg, extreme Trendelenburg before draping. And uh, a lot of times you, if you have someone new to the room, a new anesthesiologist, a new CRNA, they have this look of shock and they refuse to push the Trendelenburg button completely because they don't always think that the patient's secure, but they're always secure. We've actually had a patient who's almost 450 pounds on the, on the trend guard device, utilizing the trend guard device, and she didn't slide. In fact, prior to that, I've done patients with a BMI of 61, 62, where their arms would fall out and we jimmy rig all the procedure, all the things that we were doing, and we were completely dissatisfied with how they were secured to the OR table. Now it's much easier. In fact, the entire OR staff who does robotics is very much on board with this device. It got to the point where um, there, were, there was such a demand for utilizing it. Uh, every single robotic room has one um, in the hospital. Okay. Um, what would you tell somebody who, who looks at it and goes, I don't care what you say, those are shoulder braces, I'm not using it? Um, I, I actually laid on the table and went into 30 degrees of Trendelenburg, or as much Trendelenburg as the table could uh, let happen, and realized where the pressure points were with the shoulder um, components. <clears throat> what you find is that there's minimal pressure on the shoulders. Uh, the, the deciding factor is also postoperatively, you ask patients, do they have any shoulder pain? None of them complain of shoulder pain. None of them have complained of finger discomfort or arm weakness or anything like that. In fact, the, the couple of times that we have had um, finger tingling has been because the um, CRNA was overly concerned with whether the table was secure or not, and she had the patient gripping hand, um, uh, I don't know, hand braces yeah. and taped the hands down, and she almost overcompensated. And so that's actually the only time that the, we've had any patients utilizing the trend guard device have any nerve discomfort at all. And it was a, a, someone being overly zealous, thinking that the device didn't work adequately. Wow. Um, and y y is it your understanding that it's the, the, um, the speed bump, if you will, that's what holds the patient on? Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things that we're very, very, very cognizant of is how we place the under the neck brace. Um, what we do is we actually lift the patient up and the anesthesiologist puts the um, under the neck brace in the notch of the neck and then we settle them down onto the, onto the pads, uh, onto the shoulder device. And um, it's a very conscious effort to do it that way, um, to make sure that that's what's keeping them from uh, moving. And we've been very successful in utilizing it that way. When, when you push the, the shoulder pads up against the shoulders, do you just touch it or do you put a little pressure against yeah. it? And it varies. Uh, it's interesting, it varies from OR staff to OR staff. I tend to supervise it a lot in my rooms. We There are times where they overcompensate, sometimes it'll be angular, and so you just kind of have to make sure that you rotate it so it's even level with the patient. Um, it's just touching, because again, that's not where any of the support is coming from, so we just kind of make it that way. The other thing that I tend to do is I tend to rock the shoulder pads just to make sure that there's not um, too much contact, because that's what they're able to do. Before you put them in Trendelenburg, right? Yes, okay. yes, before Trendelenburg. Um, you've been jubilant in your <laughs> the description of this, which is greatly appreciated, um, and talking about what was of concern to you prior to getting it. Um, if, as far as a robotics program goes, um, uh, is, is this the kind of thing that would, would you recommend for standard of care? Um, 
as far as a robotics program goes, I think there are several things that impact the success of a program. How efficiently that you can function through turnover, how well you can clean your equipment, how little equipment you have to clean, how rapidly you can get the patient secured to the operating room table, um, how quickly the staff can get things ready so you can operate. You know, and, and this device definitely benefits us on all of those levels. And standard of care, um, inter interestingly enough, um, we're in the process of creating a lot of standard of care. And I would say that this is a device I would love to incorporate into my standard of care. Okay. And I have incorporated into yeah, my standard of care, right. I guess is a better way to put it. I understand that you've, you've timed everything from, I mean, the, 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 I as you mentioned this <laughs> earlier. Now, is that just something that you came up with as a concept? You know, one of the major complaints of doing any kind of robotics procedure, one of the major complaints of doing any kind of robotics procedure was that everything took twice as long. And what you saw was there were certain surgeons who were more efficient and did hysterectomies much faster, and since I'm a G1, that's what applies to me, hysterectomies much faster than others yeah, that were doing in a non-robotic environment or um, in an open environment. And <clears throat> what we found was that if we started tracking what was it that took us the longest, then we were able to shave off 30 seconds here, a minute there, two minutes here in the procedure process. And we went from like a two and a half hour procedure, a three hour procedure, to an hour and 15 minute procedure, um, you know, in a standard normal size uterus. You know, and it, at, there are times where I'm actually faster with my robotics procedures now because of advances like this than with open procedures. And so that's why the timing issue comes in, and it's crucial because if you're spending a lot of time doing non-surgical issues, attending to non-surgical issues, then it's a waste, you know, and time is money. Yeah, especially in the operating room. Mm -hmm. Super. I, thank you so much. I can't think Absolutely. of anything that I could ask you that you haven't already discussed. Because I love this. Yeah. <laughs> Path the yeah,